So today we have the Brehan Law stream. It's funny because I mentioned it a bunch of times, the idea of doing a stream with this guy before I actually had any kind of confirmation from him that it was something he would even be interested in doing. So, like, I hadn't even spoken to him or talked to him. It was only because I mentioned him so many times that the topic I'd love to learn more about and a topic I was interested in that somebody who watches the stream went off and started commenting um, on his channel and messaged him. And uh, then here we are. We're going to have the stream. Where's the other half of the strawberries? Is that what you sacrificed to leave Bertardia? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You had to give up half of my strawberries. That was just the way it was. But, um, yeah, so Brand Law, I don't want to butcher what it is because we have an expert coming in. Um, Brand Law is an ancient form of law that was active in Ireland for a long time. Um, I became interested in the topic after watching a video from Kevin, who's coming on today a couple of years ago, where he did a lecture somewhere and he kind of just talked through what Brehan Law was and how it affected the people at the time and some interesting facts about it. And I just thought, wow, what an interesting thing. Um, so Kevin's channel is um, called Brehan Academy on on uh, YouTube, which is B-R-E-H-O-N Academy. Um He's also on Facebook. He's also on Instagram. And this he does a lot of work um, on talking about Bran Law. And not just Bran Law. He also talks about sort of ancient Irish history and um, um, mythology and things like that on his Facebook page. So to me, this is going to be a very interesting. I know a bunch of the guys that watch are interested in things like um, natural law. Um, so I know that there's going to be a bunch of people who chat to me and who watch the stream who are going to find him extremely interesting. He's in the green room right now, so I'm just going to add him straight in. Hey, Kevin, how's it going? Hey, man, how are you? Not too bad, thanks. I think you live pretty close to me. I think we're we're same neck of the woods. I'm in Donna Bay. Um, yeah, it's not too far. I actually did live in Donna Bay for a few years, believe it or not. Yeah, I thought I heard you mentioning Donna Bay. I, 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 yeah. I, I'm, I'm around that general area. Um, <laughs> God. Yeah, yeah, that's a different conversation. That's bringing back on my childhood memories there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, you, yeah, I, I was just saying, I don't know how much you heard. I was just saying, I kind of came across a video of yours um, a couple of years ago, maybe two years ago. It's one where you're just standing in what looks like maybe might be a university lecture room or something, and you're asking people, what their political leanings are, and uh, and then you get into kind of Brehan Law, and you talk through Brehan Law and the history of it. And I just thought it was so interesting. And it's one of those topics where I thought, I'm going to learn about that. That's something I want to learn yeah. about. And then I keep on putting it on the long finger, and I haven't actually done the, the work. But uh, then I mentioned it on the stream a few times that I'm interested, and then, then somebody got in contact with you, and here we are. Yeah. So um, bring us into how you got so involved in, in Brand Law. And... Yeah, um, kind of a similar experience as what you described. And I was smiling as you were talking because I hear a lot of people having a very familiar experience when it comes to learning about the Brand Law. It's the first step is first um, realizing that there is such a thing as this Brehan Law. That's the, the, the first kind of like step on the journey. And I remember I was about... Um, I was about 22 or something like that when I started to uh, get an interest in the legal system that we had, or like our current legal system, before I even heard about Breton Law. So I started to look into common law and the history of common law and really consider from a philosophical and even spiritual point of view the relationship, the nature of the relationship between the individual and the state. Like where does that come from? What is it based in historically and so on? And it was while I was doing that research, I discovered this uh, Brehan Law. I came across probably a video on YouTube like yourself. Um, and it just, when I first came across it, I knew that this was something I had to read more of. It was like, I need to learn this. This is something significant. There's something really cool about this, this piece of law. And to make a long story boring, and we can go into more detail as you like, um, I eventually went to study law some years later. So I, I got a degree in law from DCU, graduated in 2013. And while I was there, I used that as an opportunity to 
uh, look at the Breton law from a comparative point of view and not just from anthropo uh, anthropological point of view or some sort of historical point of view, but really start to consider the principles that underpin it, the legal principles, and compare them to the legal principles that underpin our system. Uh, the first speech then that I gave, I'm not sure what you what one you saw could have been one of a few, but the first one I gave was in Trinity College then um, while I was a student. And I made a case for uh, the abolishment of prisons in Ireland um, based on utilitarian grounds and moral grounds, but also saying that we had examples of um, a better approach to dealing with crime from the Breton law. And I used that as kind of the main premise of the argument. So where I'm kind of coming from with all of this, why I set up the Breton Academy is I kind of realized that a lot of people, Irish people, aren't very familiar with this part of their history. And for Ireland, that's unusual because we're kind of really into our history and we're kind of really into our culture and we love our music and the GAA and all of this sort of stuff. But when you talk about the Breton law, apart from saying maybe some, you know, uh, Christmas cracker kind of sayings like, oh, well, the women have rights and, uh, you know, the farmer did this and some little sayings maybe that yeah. you see in a, a packet of sugar, you know what I'm getting at? Yeah, 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 apart, yeah. From the, apart from that kind of thing, uh, the knowledge isn't really strong. And I find this a huge loss to Irish people in general, Irish identity, uh, and and the journey that we we have taken since we got independence, which is only a short time, I don't think the journey is complete actually. And I'm not sure if if um, the people who started us on that journey would be really happy with the Ireland that they see before us now. So where I'm at really is trying to um, address the kind of world that we live in. It's a dig digital world. People are not going to go and read these really old PDFs that are hard to read and stuff like that. So I want to kind of act as a bridge then between this information, make it sort of more popular, widely available, put it in video formats. So I'm taking the ideas and the work that of you know standing on the shoulders of giants for sure, um, but then trying to like make that into an accessible, reachable way that is not just history or mythology, but maybe like triggers this little something in the heart of people who read a kind of a little memory, a little flicker of something that uh, I think is really important for the future of the country. It's, for, it's important for the identity of the country. Uh, how much do we value our cultural identity today? That's really kind of um, how I frame the work that I'm doing. Well, it's a good time to mention then. So obviously the website for Brown Academy, because I've seen it, I know you're on Udemy and stuff as well. Um, so you're on Udemy, but you have your own website where you can uh, buy your courses and they're pretty cheap actually for the, for, for the content that's in them. Affordable, I like to say affordable. Yeah, affordable. <laughs> Sorry, that's a much better word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, because like I obviously I want to make a little bit of energy return from the work that I'm putting in, so I monetize a few parts of the work that I'm doing. But the main thing is getting the information out there. So I don't want to make it that it's inaccessible to people. And I've said many times on the page and so on that if anybody wanted access to it and felt even the, the, the small price I was asking was too much, I'd happily give them access to it if they, on the condition that they agreed to go through all the materials and actually do it. <laughs> um, and I've given them access to like homeschoolers and so on, which I'm more than happy to do because the, the mission is really uh, getting that information out there. As long as people are thinking about these ideas, talking about the stories and uh, maybe thinking about how they could adopt some of these principles in their lives. And we can get into that in a bit more detail if you want as well. Yeah, so uh, it's brehanacademy.org. Yeah. Org, that's my thought, yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I definitely think people should check it out. I'm, go I'm going to do it for sure. Because um, we homeschooled as well, so it's kind of double for me because I'm interested anyway. And then, awesome. you know, but, um, but yeah, the, 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 the lecture that I watched, you went into a little bit into how people felt about the laws at the time mm -hmm. rather than how we feel about laws now, yeah. right? That mm -hmm. Nowadays, we feel like the laws oppress us, whereas at the time, we felt like, at, back then, we felt like the laws, we could wear them, they protected us, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, I'd love to get into a bit of that. I can go into that. Yeah, you set me up for a slam dunk there. I can talk about that really well. Um, <laughs> I, I like to uh, open this kind of idea with a quote from, um, his name is uh, John Davies. Sir John Davies, to be precise, and he would have been Attorney General just after the flight of the Earl. So we're talking to the start of the 1600s here, and he had a quote where he said in his writings about um, 
he was writing, I can't remember the name of the actual book, but it was something like why it's so difficult to kind of tame the Irish, so to speak. And he, he said, there is no nation of people under the sun who loves justice better than the Irish or will rest better satisfied with the execution of the law, even if it's against themselves, so that they too can have the protection of the law when upon just cause they do desire it. So that was an old English way of basically saying like, I've never seen a group of people in the world who love the law so much that even if a judgment is against them, they'll embrace it because they will appreciate the principle of law uh, that led to them being, let's say, punished for want of a better word. They would recognize the value and the logic in it and the reason in it so that if the roles were reversed, they would have the protection of that law too. And that's a really unusual thing for somebody who was not a friend of the Irish and definitely not a friend of the Breton law. Um, to say about the Irish people. Then we're going from the 16th, I'm going very fast forward now, we're going 1600s, 1700s, we're up to like, we have um, the famine, we have rebellion and all of this stuff all this time, right? The people really never settled. There was always rebellions and there was like smaller famines before the Great Famine. Uh, and it brings us up to like the early uh, 1900s where we had the kind of the, the republicanism, the, the uprisings and so on. So writing in the 50s, then a barrister said that the Irish were seen to have a reverence for law now. They were kind of had a reputation as being kind of criminals and rascals and, you know, brigands and maybe even terrorists, you know, to, to an extent, like, and especially even later in, in the last century, they were being called terrorists. So I want to like, that's interesting, right? How can, how can they go from being people who love the law so yeah. much to being seen as like brigands and outlaws, you know? Um, and so to highlight that with a story, an example, it's usually the best way to do it because that's how they would have done it in Ireland, right? Uh, to use an example of um, King Cormac McGarp. When he was a young boy, he was in hiding. His father's throne had been usurped. And a long story boring again, to make a long story short, um, there was a farmer woman called Benaid who had a sheep. And her sheep escaped. So, so this is called animal trespass in the Breton law. And we have a lot of manuscripts and information about animal trespass and what happens when an animal escapes. And it gets into the crops of the queen and they're very expensive and the sheep eats these crops. So obviously we can rationally see there's a loss that's being incurred here through negligence or through not taking care of the animal. So she goes to the king and says, um, her king, her king who, who was her husband, and uh, asked him to be a Breton, which was completely acceptable in fact it was expected that a king as a king should be able to have the judgment of a brehan or we might say in later times the judgment of a king solomon right so it was seen to be a kingly quality so he okay. looked at the case and he said right well there's been a loss here uh you should pay the queen compensation with your sheep give her your sheep as compensation and you could say yeah okay that kind of balances it out but the thing with the brehan law what it tried to do was uh was try to look for the principle in nature. So it had to exist in nature as well in order for it to be rational and reasonable in the human world, let's say. So a young boy standing in the crowd was compelled because he had the judgment of a king, right? He had it inside him. He was compelled to shout out and say, this is the false judgment. This is not the true judgment. Surely as the fleece on the sheep will grow, so does the fleece on the land grow. So the fleece of the sheep should be given as payment as uh, for the fleece of the land. And there you're not going to deprive this woman of her livelihood. So that's something that I love to tell that story because I always see the, the bit where it clicks in people's minds where they see the difference. And that difference, that feeling of, yeah, okay, that makes more sense. That was the sort of thing that they sought after. I believe I'm reading into this a lot, right? But I've looked at it a lot too. I think like have a little bit of um, uh, flexibility to read these these things into it. But yeah, I believe that that was something that they were uh, really seeking out to do, like to, to 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 that the justice was something that could be felt, almost. Yeah. That's really interesting. So yeah, so some of those kinds of those judgments, obviously, the you mentioned it earlier, the really famous ones that you kind of come across as soon as you research are the things like the marital laws and that's the kind of the only ones i can ever cite are things like um when the wool is raw it's it's 100 percent the husband's and then as as the as the female side of the job is done the the processing and the spinning and everything she she owns more and more percent of the product right um 
so the idea that when the loss has been incurred, like that, the idea that the that the the crops are the fleece of the field, um, there's a weird kind of a balance there that wouldn't even occur to us now. Yeah, yeah. There's always often a lot of nuance in it. Um, and I think one of the challenges, but there's a lot of challenges when we're approaching it, and it's easy to romanticize things as um, our for forebears have done, you know, especially uh, in the lead up to the independence. You know, it was very romanticized. If you actually look at these manuscripts, a lot of the time they're they're incredibly technical, and I don't want to say boring because they are quite fascinating, but they're just they're not written for the modern reader um, to learn about the topic. They were kind of aid the memoirs for the legal people of the time. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is like they're written in an old Irish, which even the people who translated what we have admitted that it was John O'Donovan and Owen O'Curry admitted that like, you know, we made a lot of guesses here because we just don't have a clue what this could mean because it's so antiquated now. So that, that raises a, another challenge as well. So um, it's easy. Well, it's not easy. It's, it's um, necessary, I would say, actually, to read a little bit more into things by taking a more holistic view, by not just looking at the manuscripts, but looking at um, what we know about how did they live, right? How did they live in the society? What were their mythologies? How did they practice their beliefs and their religions? How did they settle disputes? This kind of allows us to have a more kind of a broader view. Uh, and then we can, that's where we get away with reading a little bit into those details. Um, I hadn't uh, specifically heard the thing about the wolf um, and be, uh, becoming more of the females, but there's a principle embedded in what you just said. And it's that principle that you will see again and again uh, appearing through the Brehan law. And ultimately, it's a principle of property. It's a principle about um, um, uh, private property, you know, and what you're describing there is, yeah, the man got it, but she's the one who's converting it into something of more value. And gradually that's shifting the right of the value over to, to to the woman this was seen probably more in the marriage contracts where you had i think nine different types of we would call marriage but they just called it like union and basically meant like any type any type of like fornication was a union okay, okay. there was nine degrees of that so you had the highest form which was the wife and the husband both bring the equal amount of shares. I'm going to call it shares intentionally here into the company that they're forming, which is their family unit. Right. And so they're equal partners in the family. And that was the, the highest form of marriage. And then there was the second degree, which was typical for the man potentially to have more wealth than the female. So that was the second degree of marriage where it was a slight imbalance, but it was still very highly regarded. Third degree was the the husband had he had moved over to the female to a or he had less property than the wife so that was kind of the third degree which you went all the way down to like um <laughs> like grabbing the uh, this okay we're talking about a time where this was like socially acceptable but like grabbing the woman away without her family's consent and bringing her off to fornicate <laughs> in the woods was also a, a degree of union as it was called and they okay. all had different degrees of protection in the law and consequences of let's say birth um were defined based on those degrees of union so um the, the one of force the union of force the man for example would have been completely liable fully liable for any child that was born from that but the child would not necessarily be recognized by his tua so he has basically uh a child that he has to take care of. i mean so explain it explain it to yeah. I, I i guess maybe I think 70% of the people who watch my channel are Americans. So okay. um, you have to explain like what a TUA is and things cool. like that. Cool. Well, hello, Americans. Um, so the word TUA, and stop, do that Do that if I do that again, because I might just drop in words and just assume, because I'm talking to an Irishman that we'll just all know what we're talking about. Um, <laughs> the TUA is is basically, it's a, it's a concept that you could loosely describe as a tribe, but it doesn't, it's not accurate enough. It can mean a, a territorial uh, region it can mean a a family it can mean a kind of sovereign state um and this this word is kind of interchangeable when i mentioned earlier about the shares that the the, the man and woman are bringing into the family well the two are kind of acted i would say in a similar way where it was made up of a collection of families called clans and each family had a varying degree of independence and sovereignty within that 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 tour and they would elect their own chieftain from the eligible men of the tribe to lead them themselves. And if, for all intents and purposes, this was an independent kingdom. 
So to think of as Ireland as a as United Ireland back then, yeah, we can see it in the culture, we can see it in the language, we can see it in the laws, but they thought of themselves very independent and very like self-sovereign uh, as, as a family. Um, and when these joined together into a political unit, we call that a, a, a tour. So when a man went out and <clears throat> engaged in this union of force, as you put it, and a child was born, his tua would then often not recognize the child. Mm-hmm. So what would this mean mm-hmm. for the man? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so let me just like uh, unpack that a little bit, because uh, generally speaking in Ireland, we didn't have a concept of bastards. Right, which is a, a concept from the common law, which is an unrecognized son or the son, like an illeg- illegitimate son, right, as a bastard. That wasn't right. That wasn't the, that didn't exist in Ireland. Like any son that was recognized by the father and said, "That's my son," had the rights to the tribe, which is already in a very uh, progressive view of things. Okay, and it wasn't uncommon in the early times for for polygamous uh, relationships to happen. Like a man could have many wives. There are rarer examples of a woman having many husbands, such as Queen Maeve and um, Grace O'Malley, right? So uh, this this would have been happening as well. It would have been quite uncommon for the the tribe not to recognize, uh, let's say, for want of a better word, illegitimate son, right? There was no illegitimate children, except in these rare cases if it was um, a child brought about by, by rape or a child brought about by... Um, uh, with a prostitute, with a prostitute. In that case, what uh, what you're really saying is that that child doesn't have a right, uh, an inherent right, and it's okay, an inherent right to a share of this company, which is the the, the tua. Uh, and what goes with that is the access to the clan lands, the access to status, the access to inherit from the father's wealth, and so on. But that wasn't as common as it might sound. The, the fact that we're spending a bit of time on it, it wasn't as common. Generally speaking, the child was just recognized um, if the father acknowledged that he had slept with the mother and she later gave birth, right? So um, that was a very different system. And they had, if a son was recognized in that manner, they also had access to the rights of chieftainship, you know, if they're coming from that strata of society, which were called... Um, the, the people of kingly material, let's say the noble, the nobles of the tribe. Um, if he's born to a, a noble of the tribe, he also had access to, to be a chieftain. Like there was no legal distinction as long as it was recognized as being the father. Uh, the father. Okay. Yeah, so um, obviously I gave the example of the wool earlier. And uh, in my example, actually, I think I read the article on the basis, I think it was from the perspective of someone who wanted to show how progressive the modern usage of the word progressive, right? Uh, sort of almost how, how how much recognition there was for the rights of the woman in in Brehan law, right? And that mm-hmm. was things like, which there was like, divorce was allowed back then. Yeah. And there was a number of like allowable reasons. And I found it really funny. Like one of the allowable reasons is if your husband lets him get himself get too fat, mm. like like so fat that yeah, he's, yeah. Uh, that you can't sleep with him. Yeah, um, impotence, allowed... impotence was another one. Impotence or, or very bad yeah. breath. I heard. Yeah, it yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, w- well, again, like, what's what's the in principle that we can read into that? Like, what was the reason that they might have had something like such as that? I think for the impotence one, it's really obvious that the purpose of marriage was to produce children. That was the de facto reason for it, you know. And so, if the either side was not able to perform, it was grounds uh, pr- perform like medically or. Uh, able to produce children was grounds for for divorce yeah 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 so then um and then obviously as i said if if a divorce did happen that's how they decide how much of let's say the wool in the shed was hers would be on how far okay, along yeah. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the processing it is so if it was raw wool it's all his but if it's full spun wool on spools it's like 50 50 or maybe actually gotcha. it's, it's leaning in her side yeah that makes absolute sense to me as well but even like that's like what we'd call movable property right or that's goods that they've probably accumulated together and they're processing together and even if there wasn't a divorce if that was just two business partners right if we were in business together and i gave you the raw materials and you processed it we'd actually be having a similar legal conversation what was interesting about the Breton law is that that was the wife having to leave a conversation with the husband um but aside from that sort of property that was what you'd call transient, right? It wasn't like uh, tied to the marriage, right? Um, the portion, the proportion at which they had paid into 
the shares of the company, of the family, is the portion at which they reclaimed the wealth at the end of the marriage. So it was like a, a, a dissolving of a company at the end. Right? And you, you, you paid 51% into the company. I paid 49%. We're going to sell it and I'm going to get 49% of the sale and you're going to get 51 So it worked in that kind of way, which is... It's it's phenomenal that they were doing this thousands yeah. of years ago, right? Like it makes sense what we're saying. You go, okay, maths, economics, hmm, human nature, okay, psychology, it all makes sense. And then you're like, wow, it's thousands of years ago. And in in a sense, that was bred by necessity because there wasn't a, a mindset. Let's I don't really know how to phrase this. No, no, mindset is not the right word, but essentially there was no enforcement mechanism, right? There was nobody to make the laws happen. There was no cops there was no uh bailiffs you know to enforce the judgment uh so how did it work well they had to develop these what i call self-enforcement mechanisms which were just things built into the way that they interacted with each other that produced um just outcomes without the need for most of the time a need for a mediator and in the rare event that you did need a mediator it's somebody who is not trying to apportion blame or judgment it's, they weren't really judges in that sense the Brehans, um, but really somebody who is already well versed in how things have not been done in the past. Oh, this this issue has come up before. There was a there was an issue in the past like this, and traditionally, the custom of your tribe is that this is how things are usually done, and that was the role of the Brehan to be the kind of one who kept the, the customs and could be consulted on to make sure that proper customs were being followed uh, by people. So. Yeah, it's very interesting. Would you be able to give us? I, mean, I said to you before. Would you be able to give us some 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 examples of uh, of laws that I know that you you brought up a few during a lecture that I watched, just to give us an idea of things and how they were different at the time and how they were mm -hmm. how things were dealt with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, it's it's maybe a little bit of this disambiguation that. Um, when we think of laws today, we think of like, like leg legislation and we can point to the legislation and it says this specific thing. Um, what we have from the Brehan Law are a series of, of manuscripts that um, are not so much like the letter of the law, but more a guide for interpreting. And uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a handbook for lawyers, really. OK, so it's not a case that we would have a list of laws as such. Right. Um, but what we can extract from it is certain principles, uh, let's say. And one really interesting set of manuscripts that your listeners might be interested in reading are called the triads. And in these triads, you'll have, they kind of like Irish haiku. It's a statement followed by three answers to it. And of course, right now, I, I won't be able to think of one on the spot. Let me see if I can pull, pull some up. Um, yeah, look, you, you can look one up, and I, um, I was going to mention something while you do that. Um, so I know, um, just while he's searching, I'm going to give him this moment to search. <laughs> so it. while he, uh, yeah, I am, um, I know that I, in the in the lecture that I watched, and um, the idea was that uh, a judge wouldn't be the way we see it today, a man mm. sitting in a courtroom, it would be just a guy who's proven himself to be a really reasonable and fair minded person that people trusted. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that I think um, really struck me at the time that it wasn't this kind of um, this business or this uh, this kind of this this hierarchy in the way that it is now. And it was it was more like a calling and it was something that people just knew you were you were right for or you weren't. And um, yeah, but I think um, I would add to that, say, like, um we it's 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 so tempting to kind of project our way of looking at the system onto the past and it wasn't like there was an order of judges like what we have like you have to go to the bar and you have to study for so many years like and get into that particular it is an association it's the bar association right so mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a particular association so in theory absolutely yes the farmer down the road could be the brehan to the dispute of the two guys up the road if that's what they all want, that's what they agree. And the level of the complexity of the case is enough just to have a third party to say, yeah, hey, like, will you listen in and give an opinion? So it was a lot more of an open market of judges. That's what I like to describe it as. So in that sense, there could be a guy down the road who's just known for his wisdom and he's just known to be, like, very reasonable and he's good to ask his advice on something. And usually uh, the Brehan would get a proportion of whatever was in the dispute. It was set 
uh, that was kind of set by the law what the proportion was. Uh, but he also had to put up a, a portion of his own wealth. And if he gave an incorrect judgment, he would stand to lose that. That was an insurance policy. So let's say I'm that farmer down the road and two of my other neighbors come down to me to settle a case. And I say, yeah, sure, I'll have a listen to your case. No problem. And I put up my money and I listen to their case and I make a completely wrong judgment or I'm just like, it goes to my head that I'm a judge, right? Or something like that. <laughs> yeah. uh, they could then claim against me and say, no, that's the wrong judgment. They take the money that I put up as insurance. They split it between them. And then they go and they can find another judge and they just continue to, to, to seek justice in that way. So at this point, we're very much in the community level of how some, judge, some uh, justice could be in a minister. But really, to be a Brehan, it was, and, and as the time goes on, we're talking about massive thousands of years, and at different times would be slightly different features. But to become a Brehan, it required at least, I, I believe the number is like, I want to say 12 years of study, but that it, it sounds like it's too short, as I say. But it was a very long series of study, and they had to learn these things by memory. Oh. And that's why we don't have the accounts written down of what they were learning by memory. Right, they learn things by memory, and then these manuscripts were like to remind them of what you do in this situation, or to remind them of how the poem goes. Which we didn't mention that all of this was actually written also in poetry, the form of poetry. So we're kind of there to remind them. Uh, so depending on your level of education within that, there was grades. It was a very strict hierarchy. Everybody knew what their grade was, depending on your grade. Um, would mean how much you would get in compensation if somebody did a crime against you. Also, if you had a higher grade and you did something wrong, you paid a higher fine. So it was very, very, very hierarchical. It wasn't an egalitarian system. I thought it was at the start when I started reading about it, but it's a strictly okay. hierarchical system. Um, so a, a grade above that, you might have people who are coming from a, maybe a more noble family and have access to different information and different manuscripts and also different group of people. It wasn't like society was very mixed. There was different strata of society. It wasn't the caste system, but there was definitely strata. Um, so they would be learning what was called the, the, the filioct, okay? The filioct was the law of the poets, the fili. And yeah. written in maybe a slightly different, more technical language, dealing with different types of topics. And if you had studied that proficiently and were tested in it, then you are now of this, of this grade. Uh, I should have said the first level was called the Fenioct. You had the Filioct. And the third level, of course, was the Canon Law. So if you are also of that high level of strata of society where you're mixing with the bishops and the clergy and so on, it'd be like learning, um, yeah, like learning Vatican Law today or, or Roman Law, should I say, the, the Lex Romanus uh, today. Mm. So they were versed in the Lex Romanus, uh, the law of the poets or the noble, the glitter, uh, literati, the educated, and then the law of the free free farmers, we would call them. Um, so it wasn't as as just as free for all. It would have been different layers, and that was carefully ordered uh, in the societies. So. Okay. So um, you were going to give us an example, I think, of one of these triads, which is you said it was spelled. Oh, the triads. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So the first one that pulled up here. Um, and just to mention, I have this manuscript by Kuno Meyer. It's a book. He's, he's translated it. It's on the Brehan Academy library. So you, if you join the Brehan Academy website, it's free. Uh, you get access to this and like hundred, hundreds uh, of other like old PDFs and so on. But for example, he says, three tokens of a blessed sight, a bell, a psalm singing, and a synod of elders. Three tokens of a cursed sight, the elder a corn crake, and nettles. Uh, three false sisters. Uh, perhaps, maybe, I dare say. They have ones like that are kind of more um, to do with life in the household, uh, how to be a good leader, uh, what are the qualities of a good man and a good, uh, a, a good wife, for example. And the reason I mentioned these is to say that they're not actually laws, but again, they just kind of hint at the way that these people thought about themselves and about society and um, unfortunately we don't have there's big gaps of in the record you know of, of mm -hmm. um there isn't a codified Breton law so to speak like what they have in in iceland um so we have to kind of fill in the gaps with these other uh sources such as uh, the triads and so on and what would you garner from the particular triads that you read there mm -hmm. 
Um, from those ones there, well, the first ones he's talking about, um, there's two things I can just off the top of my head as I'm looking at it, right? Um, I, I'm trying to find back to it. He said the sacred sites, and he names three ecclesiastical things. Um, the bell ringing would actually have an, uh, could have an earlier significance, but it got, you get the sense of something Christian, okay? And in the second line, he says the sign of a cursed site, the first thing he mentions is an elder. Okay, which is a type of a tree. And so that would, to me, suggest a, a hearkening back to the more pagan mindset where the, the elder had a, a pagan uh, significance. Okay. So you could read that into it. You could <laughs> read that into it, this kind of um, uh, so where the social mind was at that point, which was definitely more leaning towards uh, uh, Christianity. Okay. Okay, that's interesting. All right. Um so the so the idea that without um sorry i lost my train of thought there give me one second <laughs> so so the idea of um of the law then you were saying in the in the now it might be an old one now because i was pretty sure in the one that i watched you said it would have been a man who was considered fair minded so maybe that was an older like an older thing. Mm -hmm. So now I'm not sure about, about what I know and what I don't know anymore. Well, but um, uh, just to clarify, it could, it could have been both. Like I just, uh, it could have been a fair minded guy who's down the road. It depends on the nature of the circumstances, how serious the case was, what level of society they were in. Um, but to be classed as a brand, there was a specific like qualification that you would have. Yeah. Okay. Now what was the, um, the British experience of this when they came over here? of this this form of law which would have been very different than their form of law right that's something i've thought about a lot actually over the years and uh i think it's a very interesting study because we often think about the conflict in ireland as what like protestants and catholics with that kind of a short-sighted view of irish history because that only came around in uh, henry the eighth right when he converted to protestantism so you had a good like 300 years prior to that when uh the anglo normans were here and setting up trying to like uh, be the lords of ireland was the official title not the king at the time um and they were they've been here for like 300 years and we I was going to say we didn't get along, but that's not entirely true. Obviously, there was a lot of conflicts and warring, but you're probably aware of this, how a lot of those Anglo-Norman fam Anglo families still exist in Ireland today and we're considered them Irish, like the Fitzgeralds and the Butlers and so on, the Burks. We consider these as just as Irish as anybody else now, um, but they're originally Anglo-Norman. So something about our stat system, I'm not going to say our system because we had nothing to do with it, but something about that system in the past was attractive enough to these people that they actually started to become Irish. And uh, that uh, saying, Nis Gali na Gael Fane, more Irish than the Irish themselves. And so around 1300s, then as a response to this uh, Gaelicization of the Anglo Normans who had begun to take Irish nurses, you know, Irish women would look after their children, they would start to speak Irish, they later became actually the protectors of the Gaelic order, because their wealth, uh, they were the, the lords, let's say, of the time, and their wealth was the one that was like uh, patronage to the poets and protecting the Brehans and so on, so they kind of did step in and fill in what the Irish chieftains had been doing, and were still doing, but at this point the Anglo-Normans are in, in focus, and the uh, king whose name I can't remember right now, um, he, so this is before Henry VIII, I think it might have been Henry II, he issued the Statutes of Kilkenny, they were called, and they were aimed at the Anglo-Normans in Ireland, the settlers who had been here for a few centuries. And it says in it like, uh, you know, stop using Irish words and stop those who grow their hair long, right? I swear it says those who grow their hair long and those who wear their, their uh, ride their horses without saddles as the Irish do, um, but it also says, and those who go to the Brehan for judgment, set, settlement of disputes will be judged a traitor to the, to the crown. So you can see there's something very interesting going on here. There's some sort of clash, uh, which you could say I describe as a clash of legal systems. Um, but, but, but that's just symbolic of the mindset is that the fact that the way that law and the administration of power and free will to an extent, which is what the law is actually about, um, the way that was thought about in Ireland was entirely different to what had come over from the continental through, through Anglo-Normans and further on back 
uh, after the fall of, of the Roman Empire. And this idea of like the monarch having this right to rule, whether it's a divine right or a birth right or something like that, that was something that's completely alien. The idea that the king could decree the law out of his mind or through his parliament, you know, acting on his behalf was something that was a really strange idea because the law was not something that was created. It was something that was discovered by observing principles in nature, you know. Okay. So... I think that that's a really interesting like conversation that you could go a lot more deeper into. Um, uh, but the, one of the things that they, this is important, that because I don't want to glamorize and just look with rose-colored glasses all the time. Uh, under the Brehan Law, everything was, all crimes were compensated through um, restitution, which means there was a payment for it. And that went up to and including murder and death. So the idea was basically that in the law of nature, it's an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. That's the law of the land. But to be civilized, we have a mechanism to avoid that outcome. And that one of those mechanisms is the payment of death. And it would have been a considerable payment. It would have been equal to the life, the value of that individual shares in his tribe and what he would have added to over the years. So you, you were essentially becoming a bonded slave if you couldn't afford that yourself. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, one of the things that the, the English, or let's say the, the British and Anglo-Normans found repugnant about the Irish system is that a man could, could kill and pay a fine and get off where our, <laughs> they would say our noble royal system, we hang them from their neck and that's a much better <laughs> way of dealing with, with such crimes. And, you know, there's a debate to be had there. Isn't there? <laughs> it's interesting though, um, because obviously I'd say the vast majority of the time, I suppose, and then of course, of course, you get these, these. Um, so you know what happens if you kill an old, an old lady, right? Her shares are going to be much smaller. Mm -hmm. Yet it's still a crime against nature that you've mm -hmm. murdered this woman, right? Mm -hmm. But let's just take the average situation where a man kills another man, maybe in a dispute, that that would result in you being essentially a slave or a bonded servant to to mm -hmm. his tua for the rest of your life. That seems. That seems like a perfectly reasonable outcome for murder, right? <laughs> it does. And, like, let's unpack it a bit. And, like, I, I actually wrote my, my master, not my master's, my, my uh, undergrad thesis a little bit on this. And people say, you can't pay a fine just to get off a crime. That makes no sense. You can't do that because you're just monetizing crime. And I said, well, what's time in jail if not monetizing crime? You're saying your, your pain is equal to this much time mm -hmm. or money, at least with the money you're going to get something back, right? And you're not taking one of the individual members of our tribe out of the society, putting them in a cage, telling them they're an animal, and then hoping that they function back into society again. So there's, there's, a, there's a huge mindset uh, uh, difference here as well. Um, but just uh, there's a really important point that I think you'll like, because you said, you said to me about family and so on. It's very important um, for you guys. Well, the role of the family comes into play here because the law didn't view... It did view you as an individual, but ultimately you were a part of your unit, okay? So if I was in a dispute, it'd be like a Flanagan, a member of the Flanagans is in dispute because he had caused the harm to this person, a member of the Flannerys, let's say down there, right? So the Flanagans yes. and the Flannerys. And let's say the fine is so much like cattle or so on, equal to the proportion of what I did to him, and I can't afford to pay it the family is liable in the first instance actually the family was liable so it comes out of their shares okay. comes out of the collective wealth they pay it and that's going to happen to you when you go home what your uncle's going to say to you yeah yeah you you've damaged home. you've damaged the whole the whole clan you've damaged everything. Damn right so do you not think when you went down to society in a society where that was a fact you would behave yourself right you <laughs> A little bit yeah. better if you knew your aunties and your uncles were ready to give you a clip around the ear because you just cost them money by by fucking about, you know, it cost yeah. them money. So this is one of the examples of the self-enforcing mechanisms that were in place in the law that, that encouraged lawful behavior without the threat of prison or Garda Shia Karma, you know, doing their thing. Garda Shia Karma are police uh, for the Americans listening. Yeah, we call them. Yeah, the guard, guard of Shiacon is just, just literally our word for police, but uh, which sounds really weird because it's so long. But um, yeah, it means guardians of the peace. But you know, that's kind of a <laughs> yeah throwback yeah. to the to the founding of the state. I think. 
Yeah, what's the what's the uh, Zach wants to know what is the fee for driving over your own dog? That's kind of an inside joke. I don't know if you have any <laughs> idea what that's about. No. no. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Um, yeah. What was, well, I mean, like, there was a fee if you drove over your neighbor's dog, and not just like even dogs had a hierarchy and an honor price, and cats and horses and cows, like depending on how old the dog was or how good of a guard dog it was. Did it guard the front of your house or could you leave it out in the fields with the cattle? And if somebody harmed that dog, you'd have a, a higher honor price. So they even extended that idea of the sort of economic value um, that we all contribute to society, to animals, which was really interesting. Okay. I'm not sure um, if that has anything to do with your joke, but <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned dogs. So. Yeah, it's a weird. Ins- it it'd take too long to explain the joke to you. He's he, he's making fun of an of a of an online streamer who ran over his own dog. Um, okay, <laughs> but Ouch. That, that's it. Um, so no, that's obviously not to me. Sorry, I saw a message there. It's not to me. It's to somebody else. Um, Zach also says a cow was the most valuable thing most people owned back then, even in the U.S. Yeah, so we had a essentially. Now, I'm going to just say what I think, and then you can correct me, right? But we had a a currency of sorts that was based around cattle, but it wasn't actually a physical currency. It was was like a spoken currency, right? Yeah, kind of. And this is another, like, a great topic that I love to talk about. I did my master's on this type of idea of, like, what gives money its value. And I have an article, I think, up up on my website that's kind of comparing the attitude to how cattle was used as a measure of value to the same way we use Bitcoin as a measure of value. That the coin itself, the token itself, is not actually that relevant. What's more relevant is the symbol that it symbolizes. The value that it symbolizes, yes. And, uh, and, And then measuring against that value. So there's two things I'd say on that. The, 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 the basic unit of currency in Ireland was called a shade. And a shade was a two-year-old milk cow. And let's say that was worth 500 euro in today's money, right? We know that that's the price. That's the basic level of it. That's the price yeah. of it. And then we could say, right, well, I want, I want half a shade worth of corn, right? So we're just, I'm not actually giving you half a cow, right? I can give you something else to the value of half a shade, but we're using it as the measure, which is quite interesting. Now, the sad thing, the, the next thing that we, uh, it would be wrong of me not to mention, is there was a bigger unit of currency called a cool, um, C-U-M-H-A-I-L, cool, which is the word for a female slave. Ah, I knew it was going there. As soon as you said it, I was like, there's going to be something... Yeah. Yeah, so the female slave was the main unit of currency, which I believe, if my memory serves me right, is was worth three shades. Okay, so three cows and milk. Three three milk cows, two year old milk cows who are milking. So that means they can have calves and everything they're producing. Milk. Okay, so they're not I currently believe. in milk necessarily. No, they're they're just like yeah, they're they're just mature mature okay. cows. Yeah, ready yeah. to ready to be mothers. And um, so, yeah, the word cool there is referring back to probably an earlier time as well. You know, um, I wish, like, I wanted to be as early, as <laughs> far away as possible, but that's just the grim reality. I, I spoke uh, about a week ago with David Friedman, actually. Um, he's, like, a son of that uh, economist, Milton Friedman. And I was making this point. Uh, he was kind of pushing back on a few of the things I was saying. And I was like, look, man, I didn't have enough time to tell you all the bad things about it because there's plenty of, of things that we would say today are not glamorous and we would say that's like uh, we wouldn't adopt it uh, today however it would be kind of it's a little bit uh, privileged uh, to use that word in our modern position to look back with judgment on these people and I try to say well what was the I try to see if there's an altruistic reason why these things existed first before assuming that it was just purely exploitation and so on and the fact of the matter is like there's no such thing as social welfare there was no such thing as like it was brutal, you know what I mean? It was like yeah. there, there was no police force. Like if you if you walked from your tua to another place, you could be killed, like if not by animals, by people, right? You could be robbed. And for women, God help you, right? Because if you don't have someone protecting you, you're gonna be getting exploited. And I'm sorry, that's the way it is, but that's the way that's the way it was, at least. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So again, the self-executing <laughs> mechanisms, when you mentioned the wife um uh, getting some money her what she would get is based on her husband's honor price so she was kind of not the property of the husband but she acted under his name 
while in public and she would get half his honor price or something, for example. Um, whereas if, there, if she was educated and she um, was like a good doctor or a poet or something, which they could do, they were not restricted from that, um, and her status became greater than that of her husband's, she was no longer operating under her husband's honor price. So that made sense. It was like, boys, you have to look after your mom, you know? Uh, you know, husbands, you have to take care of your wives. And if you didn't, you lost your honor price. You lost your, you became shameful. Your reputation was dropped in front of the eyes of your clan. And you should lose your honor price. If you didn't take care of the elderly in your family, you lost the honor price. So these were all self-executing mechanisms that didn't require an overseer, a great judge or a great king to enforce these things. It was just in the culture. Um, so in that way, that's why it worked. That's why it worked. And probably... Um, that's why it wouldn't work today for the same reason. <laughs> um, so the another thing that you kind of well, first of all, I'm kind of fascinated with the idea that there was a slave trade within Ireland. This is the first time I've ever heard about this. Do we have much much documentation about like I mean, and I mean just within. I don't mean an right. external one. I mean just right. that within well, Ireland well, we had our own. Well, what about St. Patrick? Well, that's I knew that's why I said it. I know. <laughs> But I was, but I was inter I'm, I, I didn't kind of realize that we would have had an internal mm. slave trade. And obviously, mm. it makes sense. Every country mm. did, but for whatever yeah. reason, I had to come across it. Well, the Irish were were in their heyday, and uh, maybe even saying the Irish is a bit of a misnomer. Like certain clans were also going out, and like what well, Scotland came to exist because of Irish Northerners who went over. There were Scots, right? It was previously the land of the yeah, Picts. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. And Ireland at the time was called Scotia Major, and they set up a little kingdom on the west coast of Scotland called Scotia Minor and Dalrieta, and it expanded. So the Irish were colonizers. They went out and they took their their um, slave, St. Patrick. Some people say from Wales, but there's also like historians who suggest they went further than that. Nile of the Nine Hostages, one of the famous kings of Ireland. We all agree that the hostages symbolize his power, and that's a great different conversation we could have about the, the way that the king the curial systems work and the kings uh, exerted their power over hostages. But the nine hostages symbolize his power over the only the thing that the manuscripts differ on is what are the nine hostages. Some of them give it as the four provinces of Ireland and then Tara. And then it's like Scotland, England, Wales, and France. You know, like what it suggests to us is that they were going out, out, outside of Ireland themselves and taking back booty and riches. And, and um, I said riches, not bitches, but they were taking slaves, slaves as well, you know? Um, but like you said, it was just the order of things. It wasn't um, I, like rightly so slavery has a, has a horrible reputation because of what we, the, the proximity that we have to the slavery in North America, that's where people's mind go, the brutality of it, the treating people like animals and, that sort of dehumanizing nature of it, but it doesn't see. I'm not saying that that didn't happen in Ireland or in the past, in the distant past, in these countries. But it doesn't seem like that was like the norm way that it happened. In a sense that, yeah, there was prisoners of war. There was uh, maybe like a tribe, uh, two tribes had a war, and all the men are killed, and then there's women and kids. Right. So what happens to the women and kids? What do you do with them, right? Do you kill them? No, you take them into your house and they become like the maid and the the, the, the the farm boy or something. I'm not saying that's right. I'm not saying we should do that today. But again, just try to trying to understand and appreciate the context of where they were at and the way the world was to them and how did they try to just basically survive in, in that scenario, that situation. Yeah, that, that kind of topic is something that... Um... The people who watch my channel would sort of. By the way, is is are my roosters coming through? Is everybody here? I heard that? something, but it wasn't. It wasn't too loud. Yeah, I heard something. They're all right outside the window right now, just uh, just slamming me. But um, the yeah, that's the kind of topic that we're into. Is kind of looking at history with a with a more um, with a more reasonable lens, and not just a projecting kind of emotion and things that we've seen on the mm. TV onto these situations, and realizing that the world was a very different place, right? That's, you know, you, we, you can uh, you can say slavery is wrong and you can also say, but the world was a different place and they're not mutually exclusive statements, right? <laughs> you know, you, yeah. So we, we, like, I can understand that, like, for example, a lot of the, um, there's a lot of, um, uh, like, Irish indentured servants, right, who signed up to that. 
mm-hmm. um, and you can say, well, there was they were taken advantage of because they they wanted they wanted to get to America and there was a famine, but um, yeah. but in the end of the in the end of the day, this was their route. This was their chance to live, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's not just. I mean, unfortunately, I mean it would be tragic enough if it wasn't just Ireland. You know what I mean? But there's still so many countries that we seemingly don't have a lot in common with. Um, you know, African countries, uh, India, they're also former British colonies. And I have, I work in an international organization. I have colleagues from, from these countries as well. And just a weird little thing we noticed, we were having a dinner there last summer, a staff dinner and sitting around this big table. And all of like those of us who had been former British colonies, we all held our fork, you know, with the, 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 the things going down, like kind of upside down. We hold our fork okay. like this, where the Americans were like holding it like this or something, you know? And we were all laughing and just made the connection that like the one thing we all had in common was that we're all former British colonies and that's how they eat their knife and fork in England. So it's like, yeah, it's it's interesting. Hold on, hold on, hold on. To... Americans hold their fork? They were, holding, they were holding it like, yeah, in a different way, like that the, the spikes come like this. You know what I mean? Okay. <laughs> it's hard to what? describe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah I, I understand what you're saying. Folks, they, they come up yeah. and they hold and then like we hold it like down. Yeah. Like this, and then we take it and then you know, yeah, watch that's just weird. like that. Just next that's time you're weird. with Americans, just see if it's something you notice. Um, but yeah, that's a bit of a weird tangent just to say that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not to hold any blame against these people for what like these things are, are people who change their Irish names into English names, like the, the blacks or the, the Smiths, for example, the Smiths or the Mac and Gowns, the son of the, the son of the carpenters, you know. Um, so are, are the wards, Mac and Bars, the son of the Bard, like, you can't, we can't, like, hold that anything against those people. It was a completely different time, and it was, it was quite brutal. And one thing I said to my colleagues who were also in these, like, have colonial experience uh, in their countries, they still can speak their own language. They still have their traditional dress. They still get married the way they've always gotten married for, for centuries, right? Okay, it's modernized a bit, but basically it's the same. And... Uh, I used to just point out to them and say, like, imagine how brutal it would have to be in Kenya or in, um, in in India, for example, that your people forgot how to think in their own language. Like <laughs> how how brutal does that have to be that you cannot think in your own language? Yeah. And I think that Ireland, maybe Native Americans, I'm not sure. I don't know enough about them, uh, Indigenous Americans. But I think probably the most colonized, successfully colonized people ever to the point where we don't even have to think in our own language anymore. You know, it's quite, yeah. and the more you study of Irish history, the more that becomes painful, the more that you feel that loss, you know? Okay. Yeah. So have you taken up the study of, uh, of Irish in a, in a, in a I, kind of serious way? Not in a serious way. I mean, I think I, 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 I've remained interested in it since I left school. I'll put it like that. Yeah. Um, And I do working with some of the texts, which are, in Irish, um, I have enough to kind of make a sense of what I'm looking at. Um, okay. But I also see a bunch of a disadvantage on that because I can't speak the the language. So, um, so yeah, I'm really relying on uh, other people. But I see a lot of hope in AI, to be honest, that the AI tools can be fed a lot of this old Irish uh, dictionaries and old Irish uh, how to read the script and then just have it scan. And try. I think that potentially the AI can solve a lot of the problems that we have in the scholarship of Irish at the moment, solving doing a lot of the heavy work, you know, so mm-hmm. a bit optimistic. There's been a good bit of a, I've been laughing, sorry, I laughed at one point there quite inappropriately because of something somebody said in the chat. The Americans in the chat are railing against the idea that they hold their forks that way. <laughs> so, um, uh, Johnny, oh, fork. Johnny fork. <laughs> I had to get one to sell it. We hold a fork like this. Right? Am I right? And you guys are holding it something like something like this. Like I can't do it. So I never learned that way. (laughs) Well I don't know. I'll have to read the chat after. I'll have to catch up on it after, but that's what I was describing. That we hold it like this, and apparently that's upside down because the label is on the back. (laughs) <laughs> yeah so yeah no one's no one, everyone's like we don't hold our forks like that we, like yeah whatever i just found it really funny Amer- and one guy's saying americans uh, hold their fork so they're ready to stab people 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, you're, you're talk, right. So, Maybe, um, so anyway, and another thing that you said in um, that I've heard you say is this idea that the that maybe Native Americans, I think, have cited Breton law mm, um, mm. in disputes. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, but I have searched really hard for that, for like proper information on that, and I have never been able to find it. Um, like I found some references to tribes using referring to Breton law for rest restorative justice. Mm -hmm. Um but nothing as significant as like going into court and and and, and um bringing in some like piece of manuscript from Ireland or something, which is what I initially thought that's the impression that I had. But but uh the reason why um some indigenous people um let me let me rephrase it. Let me start a different way. If you're studying law today, one of the kind of new waves of law uh, study is us called restorative justice, which is what we were talking about, restitution. And it's being studied today as like a new approach to crime. Instead of punishment, like there's a different way we can do restorative justice. And while it's considered new today, it's been a practice like that for literally thousands of years in all native people across the world, indigenous peoples when they don't have a centralized or kind of external force telling them how to do their law, they will usually come up with a restorative, uh, restorative system. So um, it's not, it, it should, it's not a surprise. Maybe at first it seems surprising that um, you would see very, a lot of similarities between say the Irish Breton law and an indigenous law of Native America, and even to an extent, Hindu law and uh, Sharia law, even to an extent, um, in the nature, especially in relation to family relationships, especially in relation to marriage, uh, contracts, dispute resolution, and sure, isn't that the main? That's what we need the law for, really, at the end of the day. Um, so, so for reason why um, in some indigenous people in in the Americas. Uh, have looked to the Breton law for guidance is because one thing that we were doing that they weren't is that we were writing stuff down in manuscripts like a thousand years ago, whereas these other cultures, even indigenous, uh, North American indigenous people, they don't have a written record like that. So it has been uh, used persuasively to say like our law is not just natural law in the air. Like we do have an actual traditional customary law. We just didn't write it down, but it looks a lot like this one that they have over in Ireland. And, and th this is what we'd like to use as a basis for it. Okay. Yeah. That's really interesting. And have it, has anybody else, any other cultures cited in particular brand law? Um, not to my, not to my knowledge. Um, but I haven't been looking for that to be honest. Um, there's one culture that's <laughs> it's just it's it's worth mentioning, but probably people might laugh when I when I mention it. Um, but uh, because you, you look at the modern state and you wouldn't really want to live there, but it's Somalia. Uh, interesting thing is Somalia is they got their independence. I think it was in like the eighties or something. Maybe it was a little bit later. And unlike all other former colonies that retained um, the British establishment, kind of administration of like two houses of government and how they make laws Somalia for the most part reverted back to its customary law system that's been there for a thousand years now there's definitely this differences between it but in relation to how the family unit works like the family unit being the primary unit the different types of law like the the zir law they call it would be the equivalent of our kind law um, so there's definitely parallels that you can draw um, between that and the Somali customary legal system however i don't like to say yeah so we should like live like uh, the way they're living in somalia right now which obviously is like not really governable um or it's not very safe but that's largely i would argue largely more to do with the fact that they had a pretty brutal colony there for a number of years rather than the fact that they are living under their customary legal system they're also trying to fit into this the world as it is today where the customary legal system doesn't really jive with like international businesses coming in and investing in the country, right? It's very hard to, for them to do that because they don't have private property. So yeah, that's just another one. Um, Michael Van Noten is, a, is, is the author. He wrote a book called The Law of the Somali. 
and he was a Westerner who actually ended up marrying into the tribe and becoming a part of the Somali tribe. And he writes a book about all of this. And why I, I mention it is because at the end, he gives a modern way of how can you do business in this type of system. And he says, if, a, if like, I'm picking Amazon out of the air. Amazon wants to come in and set up a business in Somalia. The best way to do it would be for Amazon to set itself up as a tribe in Somalia and actually go along the tribal custom and have all the workers are shareholders, let's say, of the tribe. And then they would be able to engage in tribal contracts. So it's interesting. It's just another like uh, modern approach to tribal customary legal systems, which I find ex extremely interesting. Okay. So would you... Or how would you make the argument that for which I think is what you believe, or is it tenable in any way to try and move back towards Brehan Law in Ireland in particular? Yeah, um, I'm gonna say no, and, and just like um, I'll be specific to go back to something. It's like it's 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 a losing battle. You know, we're not gonna convince anybody to go back to anything. But I think uh, the there's definitely a value in researching Breton law for guidance into the future. So things like how would we reform the judicial system, which we could spend a long time talking about how bad it is and how dysfunctional the courts in, in practice, in reality, really are where you don't actually have access to justice because it's unaffordable or so on, uh, so on. Uh, principles like that, principles like restitution, principles about actually like the family unit. That's something that's really interesting. And that's never going to come from the government because government is stronger when families are weaker. So these are that's a principle that like how, how the follow up question would be is how would we go back? How would we bring those principles into our lives today? And the answer to that is like that's up to us individually. Now we're in the driver's seat. Now we're like really talking brand law because it was a uh, very much the individual like who you were and how you show up in society society kind of shapes what the society is a bit so that's maybe being more intentional about um treating your family like it is not a business but it's like a corporation it's a company not corporations company of people and we're a unit and we're all gonna and to, to be honest with you that's how the wealthy do it my friend like the crown is a foundation it's a family trust the Rothschild is a family trust the wealthiest people in the world do not have any public wealth they don't own anything it's all in their family family trust and the members of that family draw down off that that wealth of that trust um you know you know that's how they used to do it that's how they're doing it now so maybe we can adopt a little bit of that ourselves i think that will make over time will make uh, society stronger to have stronger family units um so that's another one as well so would you see the family as being like the primary unit of society then i think it is i think it's regardless of um what i well it's not about what i think that's self-evident i would say uh that's a self-evident principle of nature and um what i love about the constitution i don't know a lot about it but the first article 1.1 of the irish constitution it says the family is the is the basic subunit of society a moral institution who has rights superior to all positive law now what's interesting mm -hmm. if you read the original irish translation which is the size of a phone book um because they do the analysis of it. The meaning from the literal Irish is even more superior than that. It's like um, you have ancient rights that are superior to any human statute, it says. The okay. family has ancient rights to superior to any human statute, the first article of the Constitution. And then yeah. you fast forward to like a few years ago, you had the children's referendum, oh, we're going to protect the children. That's what they said, right? Yeah. But now yeah. you're in a situation where the protection of the children can trump uh, this original article which is this is the moral unit which is inviolable we at some point under the guise of helping children like let's be fair it was supposed to be a good thing and it is probably in some rare cases is going to be a good thing to take you know ch children who are in a dangerous situation but the way the narrative is moving in ireland lately with you know what's going on in schools and uh, the hate speech stuff and so on like you can see that it can become a situation in the not too distant future that might affect more people who think right now that it's not going to have anything to do with them. Mm -hmm. And they're working on, I'm not sure, that's what they're talking about this year in the Citizens Assembly, I think, isn't it? This, uh, or was it last year? It was last year. 
they they have their 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 targets set on and I don't know which article it is, but the um mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the woman's right to yeah. not be not be forced to work, right? But they've reworded it where they they they're, they're saying it's a women's rights issue, but actually it's taking rights away from women, right? I really love that you asked me that question because it's not directly related to Breton law. We didn't know we were going to talk about this, but I have like really big opinion on this because I remember stu- when I was studying law and we studied this article and like people are com- completely missing the point of what this article is about. They think it's saying the woman places in the kitchen and that's where yeah, she I belongs know. in the kitchen. It's like, read, read it, like actually read it, please, because it's really important that you read that and understand it because Every part of our history and our culture and our mythology speaks to the to the wonder and the glory of women and the fe- and, and and honoring of the feminine, right? It's not in the, not about putting you in your place. And even the land itself is called Iru Era after a goddess. So much of our culture is infused with this honoring of 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 the woman. So it makes sense that in a time where the, the traditional roles still existed, that the state would in their constitution. In the Constitution, the very founding document of the state say we honor the women in this state without whom, without whom the welfare of the state cannot be achieved. Yeah. That's beautiful. Show me a country in the world that does yeah, that yeah. for that women in the Constitution. And then the second part, which is the more important part, is and the state guarantees by its laws not to something like prejudice the woman so that she's forced into the workplace. I'm paraphrasing here. So what it's saying is, we the government promise, as your government, to create an economy, to create us a society that's so wealthy, that's so affluent, that's so successful, that only one parent should be enough to make a living and support a family, to allow you, the great woman of our nation, to raise the children of our nation as you always have. That's what's really going on here. And, yeah, yeah. and so you could argue, you could potentially argue as a woman who was forced into the workplace and had her kids in childcare, you know, like you're homeschooling, but I'm sure you understand the challenges yeah. that go with it. In theory, could you go to the government and say, I'm making a constitutional claim against you because you failed in your promise in this article to make a, a society uh, that, where I'm it's wealthy enough that my husband can go to work and I'm going to stay home and mind the kids? No. It's not. It's not affordable. We can't do it. You failed, and the government wants to change that article. Yeah. So wow. Kunk, uh, <laughs> yeah. Kunk, Kunk just uh, just commented. The woman's not forced. It's an offer. Yeah, but Kunk, see, the, the point is that we have this in our constitution, which essentially grants women the right that the right not to work. It's like a positive right where they do, they they should never be forced into a situation or put mm-hmm. in a situation where working is necessary. And that that's supposed to be in our constitution and they want to remove that. And they're framing it in a way where they're, they're going to try and put it to a vote and they're going to frame it like mm-hmm. um, this article says that a woman's place is in the home and women aren't allowed work when that's not what it says. Like they're, mm-hmm. they're framing it like it's like it's so ch- it like, like it's old fashioned language and that we don't support this way of looking at women as if their place is in mm-hmm. the home. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's, but but, it's but so completely great. ignoring their failure. Their yeah. moral, political, legal, uh, their the mandate that they have, uh, they've completely failed on. So, this, like women's liberation and everything, fantastic. And women should be able to work and have all the access to all the things that men should have. And that should go without saying in this day and age. Um, but that's not what's going on here. What they're saying, like essentially, they're taking, they're giving themselves the right to tax the hundred percent of the population. Rather than what the Constitution is saying there, that a woman doesn't have to work, she doesn't have to be a taxpayer, and um, they're taking away that right, uh, constitutional protection now. Yeah, and Irene's right. They're they're trying to take it out for a reason, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, the government doesn't do anything that doesn't benefit itself, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, in Breton law, do I own what I kill? The Americans have noticed, the Americans in the chat, a few of them have noticed that they hear an or sound in after you say or, you say lore, kind of, I guess. Lore, so a lot of them lore, are commenting lore. on this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not <laughs> so it. But, mm. so the, uh, yeah, we'll so have people, an accent. Yeah, yeah. That's just an aspect of a kind of a Dublin accent or this area, mm. I guess. I don't even know. It um, used to be a lot worse. I, like, I, I've lived outside of Ireland for like six years now. We're going on seven years. I'm back at the moment, but 
my accent softened and I got a bit more Americanized. My friends here would make fun of me saying it's Americanized. When I was in the UK when I was studying law, law, I went to the library and I was like, have you got any books on law? And to a woman's face, she was like terrified. Like she could hear the Irish accent and they always have a little bit of fear when they hear the Irish accent. And she's like, <laughs> what? La? La? I was like, no, like, you know, like rules and legal stuff. She goes, oh, law. It's like, yeah, law. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, yeah, so in, in Breton Lar, as this guy has just spelt it, do I own what I mm -hmm. kill? I don't... Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I guess he's talking about when you go hunting and so on. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so I, I would say yes to that, but it depends, right? It's going to depend on where you're doing that, that killing. Um, there was, if I recall, about five different ways that land could be owned. Most of it was common land, Fintu, which was common farmland. But the land outside of that, which was like the hills and the marshes and the rough forests and so on, belonged to anybody. And uh, yeah, as far as I know, if you if you killed something there, uh, you got to keep it. But then there was also rules in the Breton law about how you treated nature. So you couldn't be wasteful. Uh, you had to uh, only take what you need and use all that you take. Um this isn't directly related to hunting, but for example, if they took some wood off the tree, they cut a limb off the tree, they were expected to cover that uh, hole that they made, the wound, with mud, so to help it to heal. There was crimes against felling, um, even in the common land, there was crimes against felling what were called the nobles of the wood. So you had the oak tree and a couple of other trees. They couldn't be chopped down by anybody. That would have been considered a crime against all. So yeah, I and mean, yeah, you owned what you kill, which makes perfect sense, right? Um, what I said there might be some conditions is, especially later in the later periods when you start to get into like the Anglo-Norman period, where we started to adopt this idea of land ownership and the the estate of the lord and so on. Yeah, if you hunted on that land, then you're quote unquote poaching, uh, and that that would have been illegal. Okay, it's funny that you mentioned the trees because his next question was, if if I kill all the trees around to build my house farm, do I own it? Hmm. Um, uh, it's a strange question uh, yeah, because you wouldn't have necessarily had to do that. Thank thank God, because um, if you're a part of the tua, right, you're part of your your common family unit, which is a pretty big number. Um, you were entitled to a part of that land proportional to your shares, right? So once you came of age, once you got to like 19, 20, you started to show the hair on your face, right? Uh, you would be given that little bit of land that was for you, right? But you never really owned that. And in a few years' time, you'd have a different piece of land as members of the tribe died and new ones came of age. You'd have to, it was always reapportioned, which caused its own problems. It meant that land couldn't be developed over time and so on and so forth. So you would always have that. You didn't. That was your safety net, and I like to say that would have been like the social welfare, and um, for people in Ireland, for sure, like how hard it is to get started uh, on the property ladder in, in this this age. Uh, it would have been really nice if you had an acre, you know, just an acre put aside. At least you could put something on it. You could grow a bit of food if you wanted to. There was just something that that got you started off. Um, and also, when you were becoming a, a young man, you would you would become what was called your status was called a fair med bot. Bot is a, is a hut, the house. Med is in the middle, and fair is a man. So you are a man between houses in the middle of the hut, and you would build a small hut on your father's precinct, but like outside, and that was you starting to like establish your own standing in the tribe and the two and so on so you wouldn't necessarily have to go and chop down all the trees and then claim the land because again there were self uh self-executing mechanisms that provided these things for people provided you with a bit of land provided you what you needed to get your house started your your first your first um herd of cattle and so on what was beautiful though because if somebody you might hear a lot of socialist principles here but they obviously didn't think of anything as being socialist because it didn't exist it was like family oriented but then mm -hmm. coupled with that balanced against that was the the idea that you know you don't lie in your laurels you don't just sit and take your acre of land and do nothing with it you, you were encouraged it was expected of you to take that little bit of wealth and make it bigger like be entrepreneurial be be capitalist in a sense you know be creative um and build your wealth over time now what's really interesting about this, comparing it again to the English or the continental common law systems, 
and the Irish system. In the continental monarchies, a title of lord or duke or earl is a piece of property that's given by the king as a gift, as a grant to the person, right? And that's how they increase their status. Now, this is probably one of the, I would say one of the most beautiful things about the Breton law and really captures the essence of what it is and why it was so different. Even though there was a social hierarchy in early Ireland that was very well ordered, the movement of that social hierarchy was completely free. Nobody had control over it. What I mean is you start off as a farmer with a certain amount of wealth and you're on this level. If you increase your wealth in your lifetime to the same amount of wealth as, as a lord and your family retains that wealth for three generations, you are a lord. Nobody, has to, nobody gets to tell you. Nobody gives you a grant. Nobody gives you a piece of paper with a thing from the king. You damn well earned it. You're lord because of virtue of the fact. You, you're, it's self-evident again. So I think yeah. that's a really critical difference in these two systems. You were really encouraged to be be a boss, right? You're encouraged to be a boss, but you got a little bit to start yourself off. You got your communion money, you know, to start yourself <laughs> off. <like. laughs> well, that's the problem. The problem with the um, with communism essentially is that it takes any community effort and tarnishes it, right? Because we mm. we we feel like we need to take a stance either you know whichever side we're on on things that any kind of community effort is tarnished by the communism brush, right? Mm, the, uh, yeah. But um, a Catholic crow was asking, did Breton law interfere with Catholicism? Um, well, interfere is an interesting word, I would say. Um, like, the, the Catholicism is, like, deeply wrapped into the story of Ireland. It's, like, very hard to, to separate the story of Ireland from Catholicism. Um, some people would lament that fact and some people would rejoice in that, right? Um, for example, like St. Patrick came in 432 AD. That's when the written record really begins. So everything we have began post-Christian era, right? Um, now, at this time, 432 AD, the Roman Catholic Church wasn't as, like, as powerful and big as it became over the years, but still it had a presence. What's really interesting for me is that there were Christians in Ireland before St. Patrick came. We, we have records of that. And after Patrick left, the, uh, the, the early Irish church kind of evolved more like a, a Orthodox church. They even yeah. celebrated Easter at a different time. And they were more, it was more of a f visible fusion of Druidic nature ideas with Christianity. And you can find that even with the early saints. Um, but to come back to the interference question, uh, like an Irish Catholic, proud Irish Catholic would be proud to say that the reason we know about the law, Shankus Moore, which means the great ancient story, or the, it's the name for the law, Shankus Moore, the great ancient it means or something. The reason we have that is because allegedly the legend is that St. Patrick was the one who called together the Council of Nine. It was like three kings, three poets and bishop and so on. And they were to have a council to decide what what laws would become the Shankus more and what would be removed that contradicted with the, the church teachings. So we don't know anything about what was removed, right? We can only speculate on that. But and I don't really believe St. Patrick wrote the Shankus more, right? I don't think so. Uh, but this is what the this is the narrative that we have adopted. This is part of the Irish story. So we would, in that sense, you could say give a lot of credit to the fact that we know about these things. Uh, to the Catholic Church. What's particularly interesting is as the, let's say, later period of history, let's say um, we're saying like around the te from the uh, maybe 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th centuries as the Catholic Church is getting uh, getting stronger, what you do start to see in the Breton law is, is um, influences more so from the church than vice versa. For example, there was a type of punishment that came in later. And I say punishment because it wasn't actually a lot of, this was actually a punishment, um, which was called um, setting adrift. And this was based on the idea that like, if a criminal couldn't pay for their crime or something, you would put them on a boat, on a raft, handcuff them with just like their basic clothes and put them on the tide and just send them out. And the, the idea behind this was that you're leaving it in the hands of God. It was the judgment of God. And if he gets washed up on the shore further down, that's fine. He can survive. He'll have no status in a different tribe. 
or he can get killed by the sea. So these sorts of things don't come into the laws until much later. And the other thing that's really apparent is the attitude towards women and maybe to children to a lesser extent, but towards women. This is when throughout, as each century goes by, that status of women diminishes um, kind of more in line with the Catholic view of women in the Middle Ages, you know, than the view that we have of women from the mythology and the earliest manuscripts, which put them either as equal as the husbands or at least uh, not the property of the husband. Okay. Um, now, the Buzzwrecker has asked a question, which I think you already answered, which was... Um, I think he essentially asked, uh, "Are are you did you are you a, are you a Catholic? Did you say you were a Catholic earlier?" I was like born and raised a Catholic, so I've been through all the rituals and ceremonies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. He asked a question. I can't remember. It. Oh, does Brehan Academy? I was rude that asked. Does Brehan Academy practice a theology, or what would he lean more mm -hmm. towards himself? And that's that's a whole other uh, avenue of conversation, and it's a conversation that I love uh, I love to have. Um, but m my religious belief and my political beliefs, I try to not let it feed into the stuff with Brehan Academy, right? And that's really intentional because you know you you're Irish, right? You can know it can be quite polarizing this place that like you can say the wrong type of thing uh, and it'll just section off a lot of your audience it'll put you into this camp or to that camp yeah uh, so for me the most important thing is really like this is a this is a vehicle for me to highlight irish culture and to try and give people a reconnection with that and i make no distinction i do see that there is a distinction but i would just as equally talk about christian ireland the lives of the saints and hagiography and so on um, as I would about the pagan side of it. And it's interesting because like, I've seen on my page now or on YouTube video, the, uh, people argue a lot. If you put one side or the other, if you put up something about like St. Patrick, this is what he did, you will get people saying, yeah, but he killed the Druids and he chopped out their tongues and he he, he, he got the snakes out of Ireland. Like he, yeah. he destroyed our old culture and vice versa if you say something like oh maybe the druids were snakes i've done that like let's talk about that people will get really defensive no like the, the irish were sacrificing humans before the christians came here and it's just like i don't want to i don't want to like get into that i don't like to get yeah, into yeah, that you know yeah. people the culture is there and it's for people to make of it what they will and and, and pull from it what whatever it means to them uh, differently like uh, uh, individually i mean um so yeah Rua just clarified he said dead right i didn't mean it in a doxing kind of way i just respect your <laughs> certain opinion <laughs> yeah well like i'm not a, a pastafarian or something like that i have like a lot of um it's something that's a part of my life um spirituality and just contemplating these sorts of things uh, it is part of my life yeah so um okay we're on an hour and a half now i'm guessing you you probably don't want to go on for much longer um, if anybody has any more last questions that they'd like to ask, um, I'd like to ask you, what's your favorite piece of Irish mythology? Which character from Irish mm. mythology or which story from Irish mythology? It's a really good question. I, I don't know. Um, first, who comes to mind to me is Amargain, who Amargain was um, in the early migrations of people to Ireland from the Lower Gaval and the Heron. We have the two ahead of Dan, and most people who are familiar with Irish myth know who they are. But the people who came after them were Malaysians, and their druid was called Amargin. And he has this poem, a uh, song of Amargin, that he, he states when he comes. Up. So basically, they come to Ireland on these ships, the Malaysians, and they meet the two ahead of Dan. And the two ahead of Dan are taken by surprise uh, by the invasion. And they say, this isn't fair. You can't just come to our island and then say we're having a war. Like, you have to let us prepare. And it's really interesting. They say, yeah, you're right, actually. Like, ask the druid and Mergen, what does he think? And the Mergen says, you're right, actually. It's not really fair if we just have a war now. So how about this? We'll sail nine waves out to the ocean again, and then we're going to come back in from nine waves, and then we're going to try and take the island again. And they go, okay, great. So they sail off nine waves, and the two at the Danon, they come down with, they start making magic spells and raising up storms and trying everything, their wind, to keep the ship from sailing in. And there's this beautiful part where Armageddon raises his hands and he speaks to the wind. 
And he says, like, I am a stag in the forest. I am a babbling brook. I am the whispering of the wind. And these words, I believe, give an insight into the primal mindset of the, let's say, Gaelic Irish, right? Uh, how did they view nature? How did they view themselves in relation to the world? And it's quite deep. It's, you could meditate on those words. Um, it's also been made into that song. Uh, I'm not going to sing it, but um, the world's greatest. And the world's greatest. Uh, yeah. They, they kind of, they, they've made a play on the lyrics of that. I'm a little ray of hope. And da, 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 da. Okay. Okay. That, that's inspired actually by Amergan's song where he's like speaking, to, I am the wind and I am the, I am the, I am the thunderous storm and I am the, just the wave at sea. And that's one that really speaks to me as kind of like a primal insight into the mind of, yeah, early, early, early Gaelic man. Okay. <clears throat> So Zach, I was just going to address Zach. Zach's, it, yeah. actually a pre- Zach's actually a pretty reasonable guy, but you just did exactly what he was talking about. Christians have done their fair share of killing humans. No belief system is innocent of that. But that was kind of his whole point as to why he doesn't want to take a stance on it, given the, the content that he's involved with, is that Ireland was a pagan nation, and then it was a Christian nation. And the people who kind of are pagan nowadays feel that our old culture was wiped out by the Christians, Right. So when he's involving himself in ancient Irish st- or um, culture, and then he makes a statement about either of those things, <laughs> he's going he's gonna to get some blowback in his comment section. So that's kind of the funny thing. So it's funny that uh, he then defended Christians while he was trying to describe that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I just see one other question from Buzzrecker, if I can come to that. I love the question, like, is there a connection between Bre- Brehan and Brahman? We could spend, and I won't, because let we can wrap it up. We could maybe have a, another chat another time. But we could spend another half an hour talking about the connections between ancient Ireland and ancient India, and how ancient uh, old Irish is is closely related linguistically to Sanskrit, right? And how the the word Brehan, yeah, you're right, you're really picking up on it. There is related to the word Brahman. Um, I can give you more examples. The word Arya, which uh, was made famous in the 1940s by a particular German. Uh, but for him, it was about race and blonde hair, blue eyed. That was Arya, right? But that's not what the world means in Sanskrit. It would be more like a noble one or an esteemed person, something like that, an enlightened person. In Ireland, the name for a noble was Ara. And that's just two examples of many that um, uh, that show the links between uh, the, the, the Irish system and uh, linguistically and, and also the, this, the, the nature of it, the way that it was set up with the the Brahmin, the Satria, the Shudya, the structure of the society. One of the, the big differences between India, early Indian society and Irish was that India became rigid in the caste system, meaning you're born into it, you can't move from that caste, whereas Ireland always had fluid mobility, which is the original way the, the Vedas, the Hindu texts, talk about society should be, you should have moved. It's about the quality of your soul, not where you're born into and one other thing I'll say on that is it's a fact that the first president of India was a member of the Irish Republican Brotherhood and and right the green white and orange the green white and orange on the Indian flag is a nod to Ireland and they modeled their constitution on the Irish constitution but that's a that's a whole story for a completely different day that goes into like secret societies and stuff like that like yeah, um, yeah, that's all factual. You can you can fact check me on that stuff. Yeah. Well, that's like a really perfect. Uh, that's a really perfect place to kind of end it, actually, because another comment that I got was, um, uh, I think it was from Rua. I'm trying to find it. Please come back. This has been fantastic. And Zap Zach said I've learned something uh, about uh, some. Sorry, this this dude is pretty bright. I got an education today on something I knew nothing about. Uh, so yeah, maybe we could actually schedule. Sometime in the future, I know you're very busy to come back and talk about that topic because that sounds really interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I would love to have another chat again. I've enjoyed it. Yeah, that that'd be brilliant. Um, great. Well, um, I'm gonna let you go. Um, and uh, it's been a great, it's been a good, great, great to meet you. Great, great to get talking. Yeah, and uh, really interesting, great breakdown. Everybody needs to head over to your channel, Brand Academy. Um, to your website, brandacademy.org. I'm, I'm definitely going to be doing the course. Maybe I'll do some videos about what I'm learning. 
but um, people should yeah. do it. It's, it seems like it's really good, really interesting topic. I have loads of free stuff up on YouTube as well, so it's not, I'm not just like um, here to plug the course. It'd be great if, you, if you're interested enough and want to go deeper. The courses are at least four or five hours long each, and they're all, it's all video content. But a lot of it's up on YouTube and also the blog. I've been really putting a lot of effort into the blog, so I'm turning out a lot of kind of unusual interest in articles there i'm taking a little break from youtube building up a back catalog of blog articles and then i'll put them into videos in the future okay you know and that's also on brandacademy.org the blog everything's on brandacademy.org i'm on facebook here on youtube i dabble on twitter a little bit but that's the main channel so great all right well thanks a million for coming on i really appreciate thanks for it. having me appreciate the invite it's been a lot of fun okay bye all, right. all right see you later so let me just zoom myself out. I have to zoom in when the people are there. All right. I think that was pretty good. Hopefully we can get him on again. Now, he does a lot of stuff. He, uh, While I've been trying to get him on, he was doing lectures and he, he, had, um, he had a show on where he was talking that he was showing me about, you know, and he's very active. His Facebook account and his, uh, well, his YouTube, he was saying he's on a break at the moment, but it's a, it's a pretty big YouTube account. So, you know, he's very active, busy. But yeah, I would love to get him on again, talk about that topic, because that's really down our alley for this channel, I think. Um, you could call it jam, spread the jam on thick. Um, so I'll be back hopefully again. I know I said I'd start doing Tuesday and Thursday at 6 Irish time, which is, I'm trying to keep on top of this now, it's 1 o'clock Eastern time. Uh, I am going to do that. Just recently here with Growing Vegetables, things have been crazy. Um, so I'm going to get back on that we've got some interesting things coming up um, yeah anybody who has any ideas of people that they'd like to see me talk to or if you know somebody who you'd like to see me talk to get on to them and uh, we'll do that alright guys thanks very much see you later and if I can see you later if I can find the uh, the end broadcast button there we go